now. Go ahead, Jaden. It's all yours. Thank you, Mace, and uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for tuning in wherever you are. Again, as Mel said, happy Independence Day here in the USA. Um, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Jane Perigo. I call on the Mornington Peninsula in Victoria, Australia. And at the moment in Australia, our coronavirus cases are getting down, except for Victoria, where they are going up. So in Victoria, we have a number of different number plates, you know, the Garden State, the place to be, the Education State. The new number plate coming out yesterday is Victoria, the state of emergency. So anyway, let's get going. Um, as Mel pointed out, I call um, seven, eight times a week before we started anyway. And across those groups, we have a lot of older retired people because our area on the Mornington Peninsula is a heavy retirement area. Um, and we also have quite a few younger people. So it's really important to figure out how to span that age gap, which one I'm going to be talking about today. Um, We used to, in square dancing, have a really good mix of ages. We used to have a lot of young people, a lot of people in the middle ages, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and quite a few retired people. Um, unfortunately, nowadays, we don't have many younger people. We don't have that many middle-aged people either. Most of our dancers are in the retired category, which is fine, except for it's making it very difficult for us to keep the young people we have because often they're the only young people at a dance at a club night at a special event. And everybody wants to have circles of friends. And if you have a young person at your club, who's the only person under 30 there, they're not going to have a circle of friends within square dancing their own age group. And that's often why we lose our young people. So it, we really need to get back to having that nice span of ages right through. Um, from my perspective, we've never really been good at attracting young people from the outside. I, we've never really got kids, teenagers, people in their early twenties, um, just to have no connection to square dancing. Most of them have come, um, because their parents danced. That was how I got into square dancing. My parents danced, I was born into it. And for most average teenagers today, square dancing seems something that isn't cool, isn't trendy, whatever. But if you're brought up in square dancing, that isn't a problem because it's just normal for you. That was the story for me. So back when we had a lot of younger people, um, <clears throat> you would often see, for example, you would have maybe four, five, six couples in a club who all had young kids. So they put them in a back room somewhere and one of the parents would watch over them while they danced. So those kids made lifelong friends with the other dancers' kids when they were four, five, six. So then when they got to learning to dance, they already had a circle of young friends. And then they went to conventions and met hundreds of other young people. This is most of our veteran callers today all started when they were in their teens and 20s. So for me, I don't believe we're going to attract people from the outside of their teens and 20s. I don't think that's going to happen. I think where we need to be aiming is to try and get people in that 20s, 30s, 40s age bracket who have younger kids, get back to a family-based activity, whether they come along with their kids and the parents and kids learn together, or they come along with young kids and the young kids de learn after a few years. That's what we need to get back to. Um, and to do that, I think we have to start stepping down because right now, if somebody walks into a dance who's never square danced before, never seen the activity, who's let's say 25, and they walk in and find everybody at the dance is 30, 40 years older than them, they're probably not likely to stay. So the age group, which I think we need to be targeting is, and I know this term means different things, different places, is what they call the empty nester category the people whose kids have just grown up, either moved out of home or become independent, and now they're looking for things to do. And that would get us into the late 40s, 50s, early 60s age bracket. And if we get to that age bracket, then suddenly somebody in their 20s and 30s walking in, there's people there in their 40s and early 50s. So it doesn't feel as wider age gap. So for me, for us to start spanning the age gap, we have to slowly step down 
rather than trying to get teenagers involved, which I just don't think is likely to happen, we have to step down from mostly getting retirees to getting a mix of retirees and people in their 40s, 50s, the empty nesters. And then we can target people in their 30s and 40s. And that should allow us to hopefully get kids and families involved, which would be absolutely marvellous. So anyway, um, if we're going to appeal to those young people, we have to, as the name of the session is, bridge the gap. We have to pre present a product that works for the people we currently have, but at the same time appeals to the younger dancers that we may try and attract, because it's no point promoting yet younger people if we lose them on week one, because what we're presenting, they don't enjoy. So that's where today's session comes from, is talking about bridging that gap, presenting an activity that people in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s and up will enjoy together. Um, let me just bring my notes up. Okay. And the first place I'm going to start is on music. Uh, sorry, Jaden, have you, got, have you got notes to share or something on the screen? Um, I will have soon. Oh, okay. I just... I'm just reading off my own notes at the moment. No, I'll that's have fine. some. I just, just yeah, yep. yep, thanks, man. Um, one area where we're doing really well with square dancing now for me is music. We have so much 21st century music, so much music from the 80s and 90s coming out, which we never used to have. For me, when I'm looking for modern music, knowing that most of my dancers are retired in, in that age bracket, I'm looking for new music which they're likely to know. And the most common thread is TV advertisements and movies. Um, so often, um, most people will know the scene called Home, which was on Ego. That was used in a TV advertisement in Australia. And suddenly when the callers here started using it, all the dancers were singing along and recognising the music, not because they listened to Home on the radio or um, on Spotify, whatever they use, but because they heard it on the TV. And so if TV advertisements, movies, whatever we can, where older people are likely to be listening to modern music, that's the best modern 21st century music we can target because the young people know it and the old people will also enjoy it. Other stuff like um, last year there was a song on New Beat, X's and O's, which was a very modern piece. I think the original was 2018, I'm going to guess. Um, and it's a song which none of the um, older dancers knew, but it's got a great beat. It's got a great tune and people started singing along after a couple of weeks. I think everybody enjoys good music, even if they don't know it. If it's got a good beat, good to dance to, I think everybody can enjoy it. And at the same time, we need to try and find the older music that spans generations. Um, a lot of music from the 60s and 70s is still widely known by the youth today. Um, so when you were going through your collection of music that goes back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, look up, you can simply Google some songs and it will tell you if it's appealing to the youth of today. If you're not sure, um, talk to somebody younger, maybe your kids, grandkids, whatever. And I did this as an experiment. As somebody who's grown up in square dancing, my knowledge of modern music is not as good as most people my age. Um, four or five years ago, I asked my partner at the time to go through my collection of square dance songs and tell me which songs she actually recognised. And that was a really great experiment because then I knew what songs from the 60s and 70s young people today would also likely know. So try, where possible, to make sure that our new music is stuff which will appeal to the older dancers and that our old music is stuff which will appeal to the younger dancers. That's spanning the gap on music. Um, if we want to target the empty nester category, the people whose kids have just moved out, then we not only need to target the 21st century, but also music from the late 70s, 80s and 90s, which again, we're really lucky. There's a lot of labels out there that are doing this. So um, I don't think we should just be focusing on 21st century music. We also need to go back and look for the 80s and 90s, because if we want to get people in their 40s, 50s dancing, that's the year of music they grew up with. Um, where are we? Okay. On choreography, 
a lot of people say that a younger people want more challenging choreography. I have to be honest, I'm not convinced by that argument. Um, from my perspective, I know young people that like a good challenge. I know young people that want an easier, fun dance. Same with um, people in their 40s, 50s, all the way up to people in their 70s and 80s. There are dancers in every age group that want challenging choreo and dancers that want easier choreo. So the discussion around choreographic complexity um, is a good discussion to have, but I don't believe it's an age affected thing. I think it's just every age category. Some people want more challenge, some people want it easier. I don't think it's an age based thing with choreographic complexity. The only thing with choreo which has changed is as our average dancers have become older, some choreography which we used to use has become less acceptable. A good example is roll array. We used to use a lot of roll arrays, whereas nowadays, we tend to use a lot more half sachets. Why? Because roll away is quite good if you're an older dancer. And so that's an example where our choreo has changed as our dancers have got older. And also younger dancers can often make poor choreo look okay. If you're younger, you've got good flexibility, sometimes a combination which is, which is pretty bad can look okay with younger dancers. Whereas older dancers who may not be able to turn as quickly or have as active movement, their body flow shows up a lot quicker. So our choreography has changed, but I think that's a good thing. That's a change which has been good because whether you're young or old, I think everybody appreciates good, smooth body flow. So for me, the changes with choreography that have happened as our dancing age has gotten older have been extremely positive changes because it's meant we've become smoother, we've eliminated a lot of rough combinations. The only thing I'd say is don't take everything out. An example is I heard, in fact, I think I actually saw a caller on one of the Facebook groups comment that they don't call swing anymore. In their singing calls, they just call promenade. They never call a swing because most of their dancers are older, they don't want to swing. Problem is younger people will still want to swing and twirl. So things like that, if you say, well, all of our dancers are in their 70s and 80s, they don't want to swing, so I'll leave out the swing, you're far better to just call it. Let the people who want to do it, do it, and if the older ones don't want to swing, they don't have to. And the same thing goes with um, a number of other calls. Don't just eliminate calls because majority of our people don't want to do them. Just say to them, if you don't want to swing, you don't have to. If you don't want to do a roll away, you don't have to. You can just sashay across. But if we eliminate some of those calls altogether, we're making it even harder to appeal to youth. And this brings me to this point. Um, if you target purely to the demographic you currently have, then you'll get more of what you currently have. I.e., if you have an activity where with music, speed, which I'm going to come to speed in a moment, um, and other things which is perfectly suited to people in their 70s, then the new people you get will mostly be people in their 70s. And this is our problem right now, is because most of our dancers are in the retired category, we try and move to cater to them, but the more we move to cater to them, we need to consider, in our attempts to cater for our older dancers, are we actually making it even harder to get younger people? I'm going to use an example, which is a really good story. And this is a true story. This happened at a club which I danced at um, a bit over a decade ago. The club was getting approximately four squares. Approximately. Basically, within that club, you had a square of people who I classify as older, um, over 70s. You had a square of people who were younger, under 50, which, let's be honest, in square dancing, people under 50 now, that's our youth. And two squares of people in that middle age category of 50s and 60s. Now, the problem this club had was the older dancers were starting to struggle. They weren't keeping up. Um, they were struggling a little bit with some of the choreographic complexity. And ultimately, the caller had an issue that the older dancers were going to stop coming. So in an attempt to cater to them, he started changing. He slowed down, and I'm talking significant changes in pace. We're talking 
128 down to 124. We're talking a big change. Um, and with the, and he started to make other changes. He went to starting half an hour earlier, finishing half an hour earlier. Um, he backed off the choreography changes. He made a lot of changes such as pace, choreo, et cetera, to cater to that older square to keep them coming. And the idea would be, well, that way he'll keep four squares. But the problem was he did lose one square from the club still, but it wasn't the old square. It was a young square because now the younger dancers who had loved coming there because it was always a good, upbeat, energetic night, they were now getting bored because it had become slower, less exciting, less challenging. So he did lose a square, which was the younger square. And then within the next couple of years, the older square also stopped dancing because they just got older. That's what happens to all of us. And so he ended up with two squares. If he hadn't have changed, he still would have lost the old square, but he wouldn't have lost the young square. So he would have ended up with three squares. So no, he wouldn't have kept four. And this is, I think, part of our issue is when we attempt to change to try and cater to the older people, we may actually be losing as many young people as we're gaining in keeping older people. So it's something to consider. Um, and that brings me round to pace. I could, we could discuss the ideal pace to call at all day, every day. And it's not, I'm not trying to start a discussion on the exact pace we're calling at, but more a look at the general idea. In our attempts to cater to older dancers, we've slowed from calling at 128, 129, around that, down to, I think most, um, last time we callers are now calling at 124, 125. And in my opinion, we've gotten too slow. If we're calling um, at 122 to 124, we're too slow for younger dancers to stay interested. They get bored. And again, we lose them. So for me, slowing down too far to cater to an older generation, it's not getting us more people. It will get us older people, but it's not going to get us more because we'll actually lose the youth. We get bored with the slower speed. I'm not advocating we keep calling at 130 beats per minute or anything like that. Don't get me wrong. But for me, we need to keep our pace up a little bit around, for me, I'm 126 to 128. That's where I've always been. And for me, something around that is great. Um, and ultimately, people dancing at a good speed, again, your 126, 127 round there, will have more energy and enthusiasm because they're actively moving. Hence, they feel happier and you get a better atmosphere. If, the, if you're calling a 122 beats per minute, the dancers aren't moving with energy and enthusiasm. They're basically slowly walking. They're plodding along. 122 beats per minute is slower than the average person's walking speed. So you're not even walking. You're just very slowly walking. And when you're doing that, you can't build energy and excitement and enthusiasm. It's impossible. As a dancer, it actually gets painful. And with that, your atmosphere gets poor. And so, again, in our, um, some people will argue that, um, oh, we've got, and again, this is something I saw on Facebook once, is, oh, we've got a number of people in their late 80s at the club who can barely walk. If I slow down to 122 beats per minute, they can still dance. My opinion is square dancing has never been particularly suited to people who can't walk actively. It's the same as there was a hall which was used where there was six steps, just six steps to get to the hall. And somebody said, oh, a lot of our dancers may not be able to get up the six steps to get into the hall. And my first thought was if they can't walk up six steps, they're probably going to struggle to square dance. And again, with pace is saying that if we slow down to 122 beats per minute, we'll be able to cater to people in their late eighties who can barely walk. You're not bridging the gap there because ultimately the gap can only be so right. And this is the point I'm making on pace is if you cater to people who can barely walk by calling a 120, 122 beats per minute, rather than expand how many people you can get, 
you're just going to lose your young people who will get totally bored. And not only young people, I think a lot of people even in their 60s and 70s would find dancing at 122 beats per minute boring and dull. So ultimately, for me, we need to stop changing constantly to suit an older and older demographic because every time we slow down to cater to be older and older people, the harder we make it to get anybody in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. So, okay, on a few other factors, um, and these are more brief, um, things such as the dress code. Again, dress code to an extent um, is with young people. To a lot of young people, um, square dance gear does look old and outdated, but that's the view that's held by a lot of older people as well. It's not totally age-related. I think we just need to be flexible. Um, for me, for example, um, saying to the men, we want you to wear a long sleeve shirt at a convention level dance. I don't see a problem with that. People from every age wear a long sleeve shirt. With the women, um, when we say to them, you need to wear a petticoat, for example, well, petticoats aren't really in fashion. So again, I still advocate we have a dress code. What I advocate is that we are a little bit more flexible. So we have younger people who want to wear a skirt, um, which is say, knee length, but a more straight skirt, not one which you put a petticoat under, technically that wouldn't meet the dress code in Australia, but I don't see a problem with that. Again, with dress code, I don't think we need to make drastic changes. I don't believe we need to scrap the dress code or whatever. I just believe that we need to be willing to be flexible. So if we get young people come along who say, well, I'm happy to wear a, a, wear a skirt, but I'd rather wear a straight skirt, not the one with a petticoat, but I don't see a problem with that. Um, and so with dress code, I think we need to be flexible, but I don't think mass changes are needed. That's my view. I know others think differently. Um, I think I want to briefly touch on this, something which I want to throw open to discussion at the end of the session is on teaching. One of the biggest issues I found with trying to bridge a gap is teaching. The fact that typically younger people can learn faster than older people. And it's a real challenge because um, the last beginner class we had, which feels like a long time ago now, it was only last year, um, we had um, two couples of people in their early 20s. Very rare, but they did. Um, I'd actually known them from back. For those who don't know about me, I was homeschooled for much of my childhood. So I knew them back from my days as a homeschooler. And they came along to learn to dance. And the challenge I had was they were learning things a lot quicker than most of my other beginners. So ultimately, we got to a point where I was teaching them to mainstream, bear in mind. Um, I got to a point where the class had done, I think it was about 48, 49 calls. They basically had a bit under 20 calls to go. And the younger people, we had them run around our house and we basically talked them through the last set of calls in two afternoons. And then they came across and they graduated we didn't actually graduate from any earlier, but they were able to dance mainstream with us a bit quicker. And again, I think flexibility is the key. Young people right now are relatively uncommon. So if we get them, we need to be flexible to try and keep them. So if you've got young people who are learning quicker, be flexible. Think of the idea of maybe, as I said, bring them around to your house and teach them a bunch of calls to keep them interested. Um, I also believe, um, Teach weekends are something which are worth talking about. We last year held two teach weekends, one to teach dancers the plus program in a weekend, followed up by a revision the next weekend. And we did the same with A1. We were going to do an A2 weekend this year, but funny enough, it got cancelled for some reason. I can't, can't even begin to imagine why. But anyway, what this actually was really good for was we had a number of younger dancers who danced with us who could not commit because of their work or study, whatever, they could not commit to spending three or four months learning a new program. So for them, learning, say, plus in a weekend, allowed them to learn a level which they wouldn't have otherwise been able to. By learning that new level, it kept their interest. It kept them interested because they were getting a new challenge. And so they can't come every week to my plus dance because, again, 
they're busy. They've got to study, work, etc. But now we've got a bunch of younger dancers who can dance plus, who if we had have just taught it as a normal 12, 14 week plus class would not have learnt because we did it in a weekend. They were able to, and now we have more plus dancers who are younger. And those young dancers, because they learnt that new level, they're more interested because they got some more mental challenge. So again, with things like teach weekends, etc., I think we need to be flexible. I do think that we need to look at different ways of teaching dancers, whether they're older or younger. But because um, bear in mind, not only are younger dancers unable to commit to long amount of times, most retirees travel. And if you're traveling every few months, learning a level which takes three or four months to learn is not going to be able to happen because you're probably going to be away in that time. So again, I think um, different people have different views on teach weekends, but I think if we're trying to cater to younger dancers as well as older, they're worth talking about. They're worth considering. Um, and this brings me to my last point really is talking about just general changes. We've got to be very cautious because it's in our nature that we want to cater to who we have. Hence, we make changes to suit the dances we currently have. As I talked about earlier, maybe we slow down. Um, another thing which happens is we change our times. And we learned this lesson the hard way. Um, we had a dance going which was um, 7 till 10. And it was fine. That was a night to do mainstream rounds and beginners all in the one night. And what happened was a lot of our older dancers didn't want to stay till 10 o'clock. So they said, why don't we move at four and a half an hour, start at 6.30 and finish at 9.30? And I thought, yeah, that's fine. We'll do it. And it was a massive mistake because it was great for our retired people, but our people who worked, and this isn't just young people, this is people in their 50s and 60s who were still working. They couldn't finish work, get home, have dinner, change, and come to the dance by 6.30. They weren't able to get there until quarter past 7, 7.30. When we were going till 10 o'clock, that was fine. They could still come along and get two and a half hours dancing in. But when we changed, suddenly they could barely get two hours in. So we actually lost three couples from our dance who were working age, who were a bit younger than the average dancer we had, because we moved our time. It was only half an hour, but it was enough for them to say, well, it's too much of a rush. We're getting home from work, racing around to get to the dance. It's not worth it. We're not going to go anymore. So we learned the hard way that on things such as times, you need to be very cautious. We're changing to suit the majority of your dancers may seem like a good idea, but you need to consider every change you make. Is that going to make it worse or harder for your younger dancers? Because if it does, making that change is going to make it a lot harder to attract younger people, which is the aim of what we're talking about today. Um, so in general, on bridging the gap, on anything, whether it's music, choreography, etc., look for things which bring people together. As I said on music, look for new music that older people can also enjoy. Look for older music that young people can recognise and enjoy. Um, and I repeat my earlier point on speed. For me, we need to be so careful because in areas, um, I was very fortunate to be able to go to the national convention last year in Atlanta. And one thing I noticed there was how many callers were now calling at, again, 122, 123 beats per minute. And... It's just, for me, we need to be so cautious because in our attempts to slow down further and further and cater to the older demographic, we're actually making it impossible to not only get young people involved, but to keep the ones we have. Because right now in square dancing, we don't have a lot of young dancers, but we have some. I don't know about areas in the States, um, but certainly in Australia, I think every state of Australia has some younger dancers. In Victoria, we're really lucky. We probably have more young dancers than most of the other states in Australia. And again, we don't want to lose those young people. So we need to be very cautious because if we change too much to cater to the retired demographic, then we're not only going to be unable to attract new young people, but we're going to lose the ones we have. 
Um, that basically, I think that about wraps me up. I'm just checking I haven't missed anything. Um, I've just learned something that my spelling at 2 a.m. in the morning is extraordinarily bad. I did all this a couple of days ago and I, I'm not proud of this. Ah, uh, here we are. One more point. Um, young people dancing together. This was the point I was going to make. We have, often you'll go to a dance and you'll find that the young dancers want to square up with themselves and dance with each other most of the time. And I know there's a bit of negativity on that. There's a lot of people who say, well, it doesn't look social. It doesn't look friendly. They should mix with the older dancers. And I agree with that to an extent. However, if young people want to come along and dance with other young people, that's what makes them enjoy square dancing. If we then tell them we don't want them doing that, they should mix with everybody else. We may actually lose them. Um, in an ideal situation, it wouldn't happen. Our young people would mix with our middle-aged and our older people, and everybody would have a great time. But ultimately, we don't live in a perfect world. So if we have a situation where our younger dancers want to, for at least half a night or whatever, dance with each other and form their own sets, then I don't think we should be discouraging them. Yes, we should say to them that, you know, we'd like you to dance with, mix around throughout the night. But if when we don't want to go too far, because if we tell our, I saw this um, at a club in a different, in a different state where they had that, they had a group of younger dancers who squared up together most of the night and they actually got told um, if you don't want to mix with all the older dancers, then don't come. And guess what they did? They didn't come. And this is the point is things like that with young people screwing up with themselves. It's not ideal, but we need to be really flexible in our opinions if we want to get young people involved. And same thing goes, my last point is on callers. We need young callers. One of the worst parts of where activity is struggling now, in my view, is in many areas, a lack of callers. And what happens is if most of our new dancers are coming in in their 60s and 70s, most people who learn to dance when they're 65 aren't going to go on and learn to call. Most of our callers today learn to call when they were in their teens and 20s. And so when we get younger people, we need to market to them how good and how much fun calling can be. Um, there was, um, we have a strong tendency in square dancing to talk about the good old days. The fact that, oh, you know, 25 years ago, we had so many more people than today. I met a caller who I loved talking to him. He had some great stories of the past, but in a half hour conversation, I think I heard the words for good old days about um, 50 times and constant talking about, oh, you know, we had thousands more back then than we do now and everything else. And if we keep talking about square dancing as an activity that's on its knees and dying, we're not going to get people involved. Same goes with callers is um, there's so much on Facebook talking about um, the fact that, oh, you know, it's getting harder to be a caller. Um, so much negativity around the fact that, we're not getting paid as much as we used to get, et cetera. And I'll have those conversations with other callers, but in a public forum, no. Because the more negativity we talk, the more we talk about how, how, how callers are finding it now and everything else. If you're a young person looking for a hobby to get into to complement your work, or maybe even a full-time job, as I've got into with calling, you're not going to pick an activity that everybody's telling you is dead, dying, and will be gone in 10 years. I actually got that. When I started calling, I had a caller tell me that it's no point learning to call Jane because in 10 years, the activity will be gone. Well, it's 12 years later and it's still here. So I'm not sure that argument is too logical. But again, if we, we need to be really cautious. And I think, especially with our senior callers who've been around um, and had so many great memories, is we need to tell our younger dancers who are thinking about calling how much fun, how much enjoyment we've got out of calling without phrasing it as it used to be so much fun. It used to be so much fun and it isn't anymore. We need to phrase it as what we've, as what our, um, especially our veteran callers, what they've experienced and that the young callers of today, they can experience that now in the future. And it's just, 
it's a change of thinking where the more we say square dancing is dead and dying, A, we're not going to get any people if we keep saying that, but especially younger people. Younger people today are mostly relatively planned out. They go to university. They're planning their future. They're planning their future career. And if we want them to consider square dancing and square dance calling as a part of their future life, then we need to be encouraging them that they can set the future. And from my perspective in calling, um, I do get depressed at times when I see how our numbers have dropped and what we used to have. And I do sometimes wish that I've been around 20 years ago when the numbers were higher. But at the same time, every challenge is an opportunity. As the young callers, we have the opportunity to turn the activity around. We have the opportunity to try, and, as I spoke about earlier, try and slowly step down the age brackets to get back to getting families and kids involved. We have an opportunity to do that. So as younger callers, yes, it's a challenge, but a challenge is an opportunity. And so for me, whenever we get younger dancers, younger callers, we need to stop telling them so much about the good old days. Don't refer to them as it used to be so much fun. I still hear this so often. We used to have so much fun. This used to be so good. The more we say it used to be so good, the more we convince people that it isn't anymore and the more they look for something else to do. So to wrap up, basically that's about all I've got. Um, I do really want to throw open to the discussion, especially on teaching and different people's experience and ideas with teaching younger dancers because um, it is a really tough part of spanning the age gap is finding a way to keep our younger people involved through teaching when they're able to learn so much quicker. So I'm really eager to hear what people think of that what people's experiences are with younger dancers. But ultimately the key point I want to leave you with is we can't bridge a gap that's too big. If we try and change to cater to people who can barely move, then we're just going to turn away the younger dancers. We need to ensure that our activity that we present and rather than focus so much on how to promote and how to get people in the door, we need to focus on the activity for those people walk in the door and see. I mean, everything from music to the speed to the time slots, everything. We need to look and think, will our activity appeal to retirees, people in the middle age and people who are young? And if we're not sure if it will appeal to people that are younger, we need to consider what changes could we make? Could we call a little bit faster than we are now? Could we use a bit more modern music? Could we move our times around a little bit? Could we be more flexible? look and make sure that the activity we present to the young people today and in the future is an activity that they would want to be part of because that for me is the key of promotion. It's not only getting people in the door, it's convincing them that when they walk in the door, they are looking at an activity that they want to be a part of. Um, that wraps me up, Mel. And yeah, we'll throw into a wide discussion. And thank you for joining in this morning. Um, I don't know about anybody else, but for me getting up at 9am to listen to somebody talk for a while is a good effort especially when that person's me. So thank you all. I appreciate you tuning in and look forward to hearing what people's thoughts are. Well, before we open it up, Jaden, um, first I want to say thank you. Uh, excellent presentation. You've covered a lot of area. I would also like to say you've stirred up a hornet's nest. <laughs> These are combinations of questions. So I'll just go through them very quickly. Questions and or comments. Uh, yep. Go through the questions first, probably, if you could. Yeah. Um, well, I, yeah, haven't, I haven't gotten in any specific order, so I was just going in the order in which they were coming. Yeah. Um, you were talking about choreography. Um, you talked mm -hmm. about dumbing down choreography and whatnot. There was a comment that came up that says, poor choreography existing is common here because it's been allowed to happen. Now mm -hmm. it's gone, and we have lost so much. How do you keep good choreography, such as star through, swing, roll away, so that we keep the young ones. Um, you followed that. I think you started talking about that by teaching replacements. And you, know, mm. you teach a roll away, but you teach them how to do a half sachet at the same time, that kind of yeah. stuff. Do you want to comment? Well, to sort of um, answer that just a tad further, I use the same thing on dive through. Now, I, I'm a young person, and I hate dancing dive through as much as any older person, believe me. But I will teach the older dancers that if you're doing a dive through, and same thing with, more well, younger dancers as well. You're doing a dive through, raise a hand, let go of it. Don't have to hang on. The people who have to hang on to the hand on the dive through, I don't understand it because they take their shoulder out. 
So again, things like dive through even. If our younger dancers want to dance dive through, if we teach older people that if a dive through is called and you can't get that high, just put your hand up a little bit and let go. Step out into the California twirl. But same thing as you say, on swing, on roll away, et cetera, is we need those sort of calls. Um, I saw somebody put forward their list of calls they dropped from the mainstream program, and it was literally um, dive through, which, again, I can understand dive through, but the other calls I wanted to drop was star through, box and that, roll away. They even wanted to drop swing. It's true. They wanted to drop swing because, oh, older people don't want to swing anymore. Um, and this is the point, is that is where you are changing far too far and you are just eliminating the younger people's enjoyment. So again, with any of those calls, teach people how to substitute them, teach them they don't have to swing. They don't want to, they don't. They don't have to roll away. They can just slide across. But I wouldn't want to eliminate those calls because there are a lot of younger people that still enjoy dancing them. So, yeah, I think um, that covers that one. Okay, next comment was on recruiting at less than 50. It said, uh, less than 50 is our youth. I'm assuming they're talking age. Uh, that was followed up with 128 to 124, you said. 124 is a comfortable pace. Less than 120 is bad. 120 to 128 is good. There was a number of comments on pace, so I'm just, I'll come yeah, back. Yeah, I saw some of the comments on there. Uh, I'll come back to that one in a second. Um, there was a comment yep. here. Catering to the older, I'm assuming that's older dancers, catering to the older is not changing music and getting boring, it is pace. Uh, too many slow down and lose the olders because it's too slow and the youngers don't like it. Dance to music and beat is important to all. Teach smaller steps and teach it properly. Mm. That was more of that's, a comment, but just reinforcing yeah. what you said. Mm. Um, well, just um, on that note, actually, something which I did forget to mention was actually something which you explained to me about when we talked about this session was some people have said um, a way around it is if we have older dancers who can't keep up to the music we're using is to leave the music where it is and slow our delivery down. And I wanted to quickly touch on that point is that is something which I'm not a fan of because we teach square dancers to step to the beat of the music. So if we then say that as a way to get older dancers coping, we'll leave the music at 128, but we'll slow down our delivery, that means we are basically saying the dancers are not going to step on the beat of the music. That, um, so for me, that is not something we should be considering. If, our, if you were calling a dance and you have older dancers there who can't keep up to the speed you were calling, then, again, we're going too far. Drop the speed a little bit. If your approach is, I'll leave my speed where it is and just um, slow my delivery down, then you're taking away the biggest aspect of dancing, which is dancing to the music. Yep. Um, there was a comment, there was a lot of comments on what you were saying about beat as well and pace. Yep. Uh, uh, you said 126 to 128 is energy enthusiasm. 122 mm. is walking. That's a slow walking speed. There was a mm. contradiction up here and please send me the information. Uh, health experts say 100 steps per minute or 100 beats per minute is a brisk walk. Sustained 120 to 128 for 10 minutes is relaxing but brisk. 124 to 130 is cardio, slight raise, and beginning to sweat. I'm, I'm assuming this is somebody that, that does this on a treadmill or yep. a pace. That actually goes hand in hand with what you're saying. It, it, mm vary the pace you were going between 122 to 128, 122 to 126. For me, 124 to 128 is the comfortable beat range. Yeah. Uh, and it depends on what, what kind of song. And I think you were in there because you at one point you said, oh, um, somebody said at 122 or 120 to 122 beats per minute, singers sound very bad, especially since most music is recorded at 126 to 128. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, on the beats per minute, as I think I said, um, the exact beats per minute that callers use, everybody has their own system. Yeah. My point is more generalized comment. And for me, like, again, I'm a 126 to 128. That's what I started with 15 years ago. And personally, I haven't changed because for me, that's a good, comfortable pace. Um, 124 to 128, 124 to 126, that works as well. Where... I think personally, for me, 124 is a cutoff. 
I think when people start dipping below 124, it starts to get just too slow and almost painful. It's almost plodding. Um, so again, the range you use, everybody will have their own view. Some will say 126 to 130, 124 to 128, whatever. But more, it's a generalized point that be careful because if you go too slow, you're just going to not only lose the younger dancers, but lose a lot of older dancers. I, uh, heck, I think no matter what age you are, dancing at 120 beats per minute is just dull and painful. Yep. So, yeah, so again, it's not an exact number. It's more talking about the general idea of not going too far when you're slowing down. And there, there was a few comments along that line in the private chat, which was essentially don't go below 122 because music is not recorded. If you get below that, it just sounds bad, which I yep. agree. Uh, comment dress code, good comment. Let them dance and be comfortable. If they want to get clothes, eventually they will get clothes if they like it. Yeah. Pretty statement. Um, and as I said, on dress code, that applies to all ages. Yeah. There are older people that don't like square dance gear any more than young people, and there are young people that like square dance gear. So, you know, it's, as I said, on things like choreography and um, dress code, they're great discussions, but I don't think they're necessarily age-related. Yeah. There was a, an interesting comment here. It says, uh, older dancers are sitting out more tips or sorry, mm -hmm. talking about pace, older dancers will sit out more. And then the follow-up on that was dancing slow wears you out. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm assuming what he's saying is if you're dancing to the beat and you're dancing comfortably, you've got a lot more energy, you've got a lot more enthusiasm, it feels better. But if you mm -hmm. slow down to cater to the old people, when they dance slow, it's more tiring than actually dancing. Um, I'm not sure if that's what the comment was made, but those two were made in the same line. So it's just a yeah, I think where you that's a point. Yeah. Well, it's interesting how that argument is actually, I've got physical proof of that argument, was we had, um, for those who know, we have weekends every year with international guests. And I won't use who they were, but one caller came here and called their entire weekend of 126 to 128. I think maybe a couple of things on 129. That was the range, 126, mostly 127, 128. And the following year, the caller called everything at around 124. Summer stuff was down to 122. 124 was about as fast as they went. Both weekends were basically the same amount of people, the same times, and very similar river. What noticed, by the last session, the weekend with the caller who was calling at 127, 138, the dancers had far more energy and enthusiasm than they did the next year. So... Um, because you were dancing faster, you feel good, you feel active, you feel energized. For me, um, and everybody sitting down, which is excellent, I do have a membership to a local gym. I mean, I, I really only use it a couple of times a year, but I do actually have a membership. Yeah. There's a machine there which I love. Um, it can do anything potato chips, soft drinks, nuts. It's brilliant. It's my favorite machine at the gym, seriously. But anyway, I do go occasionally. And when I jump on the treadmill, if I move, um, the faster I go within reason, I do set off feeling more energized and active. Um, and I think a comment I saw somewhere on here was talking about tips or brackets, depending how you call them. And actually on the point of brackets, um, there's a lot of discussion about how long your brackets are. One way to bridge the gap is to keep your brackets shorter. A lot of callers nowadays are doing eight and nine minute hoedowns, which I am not a fan of at all. For me, if you keep your hoedowns down to five, six minutes, absolute max, and then you see and call then go off the floor, the benefit is the younger dancers who want to dance, they will then get up the next bracket. The older people who need a break, they can sit out. If you make your dance, your brackets too long, the older dancers are just struggling you can often see when callers are doing those eight nine minute hoedowns by the singing call the older dancers have either had to swap out or they're just getting so tired so if you keep your bracket shorter it's another way to help bridge the gap because the younger dancers they just get up the next bracket but the older dancers they can sit out so that's another good way to bridge the gap is to keep your brackets shorter that's yeah, good. That's three more comments gone off the list because that was one of the <laughs> group. Um, <laughs> you mentioned, uh, just, just to clarify, for those that you don't understand yep. the term bracket, uh, that's yes. the same as a tip in the U.S. 
So yep. when they say bracket here, that's the same as a tip, a patter in the singing call. Yeah. The, um, old exp the explanation I use for that is Jeff Roberts came here and told a story. I have no idea if it's true. But in America, they call them tips because at the end of the tip, they go up and tip the musicians who played the music. And in Australia, we never tip anybody. So that's why we call them brackets. Quite probably. <laughs> it's as good an explanation as any. Works for me. Um, it, it does sound good. Yeah. Exactly. Well, we're, we're a little bit behind the U.S. in development as far as square dancing goes. So who knows? They might actually start coming up and tipping the caller here. Could, could get to be time. <laughs> Um, you I'll, I'll, I'll get a credit card machine ready to go. Tap and go. That makes it easy. Um, you mentioned Teach Weekends. The question was, is that a blast class? Um, and well, the reason, oh, there's a follow-up on that. It says, learning a level in a weekend is not possible. Learning basic vanilla is possible, but they need a club to dance with and be comfortable. And well, then there was another comment on that same thing that said, the rush to plus is the death of square dancing, regardless of level. Uh, use the choreo better. Using the choreo better is better. So that's a combination of comments just collated. Yeah. Um, on the teach weekends, I don't use the word blast class. I don't like that word. Um, as far as I've heard the argument many times that you can't teach a program in a weekend. And for me, the only answer I can give to that is... As I said, we taught plus last year. We taught it on the weekend. We had a follow-up the next weekend of the Saturday, a follow-up to the previous weekend. We had two and a half squares go through that, and all of them were good plus dancers. They came to our plus dance, and they were, there was no problem with their plus dancing. They were no different to the standard of plus dancers that you'd usually graduate from a plus class. So really the only argument I can put up against that is, from my own experience, it can work. And the point is, I agree with the idea that the rush to plus is a problem. None of these people who learned in this weekend had been new mainstream dancers. One of the requirements to do it was they had to have been dancing mainstream for, um, I'm pretty sure we said two years, because if you're not a solid mainstream dancer, you're not going to be able to learn a higher program in a weekend. You have to be a solid mainstream dancer to do that. The whole thing with the rush to plus idea is if you have a young dancer that is getting a little bit bored with mainstream, one of the best ways to keep them involved is to teach them a new level. And hence, I like the Teach Weekend idea. So I don't believe Teach Weekends contribute to a rush to plus. Um, for me, if you have a requirement that they have to have been dancing mainstream for X amount of time before they go to a Teach Weekend, um, then I don't believe it contributes to the rush. And again, as I said, is some people will like them, some people will not, that's fine. Overall, my point is we need to be flexible. We need to consider things like Teach Weekends, like um, something I think, I can't remember who it was, one of the callers in the States taught plus. It was like, it was a blast style thing. It was done over like five weeks, but it was um, four hour sessions each week, something along that lines. Again, I think we need to be flexible to all those possibilities because as our activity changes and if we're trying to cater to young and old, then no idea should be off the table. Okay. And then uh, a couple of other comments. Um, excellent comments on bridging the gap, looking for people that, looking for things that bring people together of all ages, such as the music. That's a great idea, having younger people look at your music to see what they recognize. Um, dumbing down choreography, but speed is a problem. I'm not sure what was meant, meant there. That is why they rush the levels and dance bad everywhere. Teach and call properly with a good mix to keep it interesting. I think that's just pretty much a repeat, and I think you covered that. Uh, excellent yep. comments. Stop the negativity, especially in forum discussions, because forum discussions are followed by dancers too. Uh, mm. That was it. A couple of comments that came in privately were, uh, since we started this, was um, for Star Through. I'm just where do you cheat? Teat, blah, 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 let's try that again. Do you teach the cheats for Star Through as you go? I'm assuming they um, are through, dive through, letting go of the hands, rejoining the hands. Do you teach okay. that when you teach the movement? Uh, basically, yes. I like with dive through, which is the best example I could use, is I will teach when I do dive through, I'll teach them what the call is. I'll show them 
I actually demonstrate once what the definition is. I won't even force them to do it properly once because, again, if you've got a bad shoulder, your arm can't get right up here, even doing it once is bad. So I will demonstrate a dive through. I'll demonstrate a roll away, and I'll say at that time, if you can't do the dive through, if you can't do the roll away, here's what you can do instead. As long as your dancers are aware that by letting go of hands on a dive through or by sliding across on a roll away, as long as they're aware that isn't the definition and they are shortcutting for their own benefit, then yeah, teach it at the time. Just make sure they're aware that what you've shown them there is a different way to do it, not the actual definition. Yeah, another comment, which was a follow one, I think clarifies one of the problems is dumbing down choreography, but also dumbing down music speed. That's dumbing mm. down dancing as a whole. Don't do it. Uh, just yep. a comment. Um, another one do they t still do three songs per bracket in australia uh, not really that's that's a different that happens a lot at uh conventions i've never liked that as an idea a lot of callers don't like it um, mm. a lot of programmers convention programmers like it because it, it allows them to fit more people in but it, my personal opinion it's not good for the dancers that's more of a programming discussion than anything mm. but feel free to comment and it got well it goes back to the idea of bridging the gap. And the problem is um, if you have, ultimately, if you have three numbers, then you've got at least 12 minutes dancing, essentially. And for me, in the problem with that is your younger dancers may be fine with that. But if your older dancers can't dance that long, then they've got to swap out. And ultimately... It's a shame if a dancer has to swap out before the singing call because we've always said the singing call is the icing on the cake. It's um, the icing from your hoedown. So if you're going doing brackets that are too long and your dancers can't enjoy the singing call because they've got to sit out and swap with somebody because the hoedown's been too long, then you're sort of missing the whole point of the singing call. So again, for me, um, shorter brackets are a key way to bridge the gap because it allows us to... If you're an older dancer that can only dance for a few minutes then needs a break, you can do a bracket, sit out a bracket. If you want to dance more, just simply get up the next bracket. Uh, uh, the last one is dumping do say do, et cetera, a good idea in preference to lower the music timing. I think you've already answered that one. Dumping movements is never a good idea. Uh, mm. Getting people to dance and dance properly is a good idea. Mm. Um, I want to say thank you, Jaden. It's now 10 o'clock. Um, congratulations, you've hit the highest level of questions and comments on a presentation yet uh, in, the, in the chat that I've seen, 21 different questions and comments. So definitely it shows that your topic has been interesting. I don't see anybody yawning or falling asleep or nodding off in there. So what I'm going to do now is... I can fix that. <laughs> I'm going to open the floor. Um, you can unmute yourselves and talk to Jaden directly. He's agreed to stay as long as anybody wants to talk to him. Hmm. Um, yeah, good, Jaden. Uh, one thing I think is good when we have an older group is the sing-along music and get them to sing along. They forget. They can't keep up, and they will. They'll sing along with you, and I think it's a good uh, thing to have in your repertoire is sing-alongs. And, um, yeah, I agree. And sort of with the sing-along idea is, um, that's where, like, as I said earlier, is try and find your, the music that bridges the generation gap. There's um, the best example I can use off the top of my head is, for example, Disney songs. I mean, um, who, if any young person today doesn't recognise Disney songs, they've had a really depraved childhood, let's be quite honest. And that's the sort of idea is if for everybody to sing along is fabulous in a singing call and to do that, yeah, you need to find those songs which older dancers know and hopefully younger dancers will as well. So, yeah, I agree, the sing-along is great. And if you can find music that everybody knows, it makes it work for everybody rather than just a sing-along for some people. Good comment. Floor is open. Uh, I have a question. Of those of us who are now older dancers, how many were youth dancers? And what did you like then that you don't like now? 
I was a youth dancer. I liked the speed. I still like the speed. Okay. I liked to swing. I liked all of the things I had then. Mm. Is are we, you know, and the dancers who were dancing in their sixties and seventies, back when in the seventies and eighties, we didn't change for them, did we? I mean, oh. <laughs> seriously, no, um, we didn't. I I agree a hundred percent, and the sort of the point which you're um, sort of going to there is we've made so many changes in square dancing in an attempt to cater to an older demographic, but ultimately, um, if we ask the question, have they worked? Well, if you consider the fact that um, in America and Australia especially, our numbers are far lower now than they were before we started making all these changes, that's a pretty quick indication that the changes haven't worked. So, yeah, I think the point you make is really good that we we used to have when we were dancing a lot faster and with a lot more energy. We still had old dancers back then. We had people in the sixties, seventies, even early eighties dancing back then, and we didn't change back then. So, um, I think it's a great point. Just just an add on on that part of what yeah. you said, just to bring it into what you said earlier. As we yeah. recruit dancers, it's dancers bringing in dancers that keeps our numbers up. And as, yep. our, as our age gets older, our newer dancers are now coming in 65, 70, 75 years of age. Mm. They didn't grow up dancing a swing and dancing a roll away. They grew up mm. coming in, here's an activity, you're too old to walk or go for a walk on a treadmill or play tennis anymore. Let's mm. try square dancing. It's a nice gentle activity for old folks. And the, yeah. the mentality of teaching it that way instead of teaching it as an activity for everybody at every age group is mm. part and parcel of what led to the decline of why older people don't swing, why older people don't do this. It's not wrong. It's just a simple statement of fact. Uh, mm. as people get older. Younger people tend to treat them as old people. And if they're brand new to an activity as an old person, uh, it, it comes down to a comment that I heard when I saw a line dance presentation given in Ottawa in a park, and they were looking at line dancing. It was a seniors group doing line dancing, and then they had a, another seniors group doing square dancing, and a line dancer who was about 75 years old said, oh, I'm so glad I saw that. Now I've got something I can do when I get too old to line dance. And that just, yeah. that struck home right there. Yeah, I I agree a hundred percent. And this um, this is the thing is in square dancing, we've tried to shift the goalposts, and it just doesn't happen. If we try, as you say, if we make it into activity for people who can't go for a walk or play tennis, whatever, decide oh we can go square dancing now. Well, we may think that increases our numbers. No, it just means our demographic shifts from a younger age bracket into an older age bracket. So I agree hundred percent is if we're saying um, this is something that people who um, can no longer walk, uh, walk properly or whatever can come along and do. That's, that's really sad. That's part of the problem. I agree. Totally. Yeah. Yes, Roz. Um, you're talking about old dancers and young people. Don't mm. forget old people like to dance quick as well. Yeah. In Narracourt, yep. they did a high energy dance, a, a couple of them, and the floor was full, and there yep. were older people there, and they loved it. So yeah, I agree. But this, um, we have the same Victoria at our last, um, I think it's our last two state conventions. We've had a high energy session, and they've been tremendously well supported. Um, they've, and indeed, there's been as many older people as has been younger people. Being on a walk. Sorry, I think Roz has got low bandwidth, so you guys were kind of talking over yeah. each other. Sorry, Roz, do you want to repeat your comment there, the last part of it? Because you, you sort of froze on it. And that dropped off. Yeah, sorry about that. Penny rang up, so I've just it interfered. Yeah, no, it's, it's just that older people like to dance quick as well. Yeah. So don't just prejudge your old and that you're on a walking stick and that. Um, oh, also, great. timing. I hate stop, start dancing. Mm. Where, because your body flow goes and it makes mm. it more tiring. So if mm. you've got songs that, if you do choreography that actually moves the dancers, keeps them going, 
and mm. still have a bit of a rest up and back to give them a break in between. But dancers don't get as tired. Yeah. So old dancers could cope. But if you're doing yeah. stop, start, slowing it down, it's more tiring. Yeah, I agree totally. And that sort of goes into the earlier point was um, if you say, well, the way I'll help dancers keep up is to keep my music fast and just slow down my delivery. That's exactly what happens is stop, start calling. And um, something like that I think Mel's going to be touching on over the next few weeks is um, about building blocks with choreography to ensure that we avoid this thing where callers get up on stage and they are literally calling um, with five second gaps between each call because they don't know what to call next. I think um, Mel's going to be looking at building those basics so that doesn't happen because a lot of stop start dancing is not because the caller wants it to be stop start, it's because they don't know what to call next. And again, that stop start dancing is painful for any age bracket and it's especially dull and boring um, yeah, with younger people and older people. So um, I see Rod down there in California, sunny California. Uh, you made a comment earlier, um, which was in that stop dancing, slow dancing and whatnot, especially for old people. Old people sit out more when it's slow because it's too tiring. Did you want to expand on that a bit, Rod? Uh, uh, actually, what I've seen is a lot of the older people that, that are slowing down will still come out and dance, but not every tip but they don't want to dance slow and and like Jaden was pointed out you start slowing it down too much and, and people just wear out I, I found I, you know before this COVID thing I, I called six nights a week and uh, I can see that in my you know if I start calling slow people are leaving early if I keep the energy up I keep the, the tempo up uh, you know the, the people are still dancing, uh, having a good time the last dip and walking out the door with a spring in their step. You mm -hmm. slow it down and they, they start dragging. And so the older people, a lot of them, will dance every other tip or dance two tips, sit out one. And uh, they may not dance a whole night, but they, they, they'll dance more when the pace is, is, is where it should be. Mm -hmm. if you slow it down, they'll dance a couple and get tired and go home. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I just. I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, uh, okay. I just. I just like to point out. Um, Rod is one of the uh, recording artists and owners of one of the record production companies. Is it one or two? It's actually three. Three. Okay. Well, you added five, the last time. Have, we have Fine Tune <laughs> Records, and we have Goldwing Records, and we have Sharpshooter. We we started Sharpshooter as a youth music project uh, a number of years back, uh, I've got three kids that are in their 30s now. And uh, so we, Rick Hampton, who's a co-producer, has, has uh, two daughters and they're also just a t tad younger than mine. And we went to their, our kids and their, their, their friends and we, you know, we started asking them what kind of music they liked. Uh, and we set up a, a, a prepay on the first sharpshooter project. If we got enough people to prepay, we would we would produce some music. And uh, it was really uh, eye opening what the kids actually listened to, because uh, well, a good example. I was in a, a Harley, a motorcycle store, and the music on there had stuff from the fifties, the forties the 2020s or 19s actually and i was going i asked the lady the young 18 year old girl who was helping us this is uh what station you listen to she was oh that's my uh, playlist on my iphone so she was listening to big band she was listening to 50s rock and roll mm -hmm. she was listening to rap <laughs> you know she listened to everything they would listen to more music than we did yeah, um, and actually one. Sorry, the re the reason I I, I asked Rod the question is because they produce, and I've got a lot of your records too. Or well, not records anymore. Actually, I do have a lot of records because Rick actually sent me a bunch of records. But the music that they produce, and most music producers now are between the one twenty sixth 
uh, sorry, 124 to 126 beat per minute range on the production. Some still go up to 128. And the reason I, I wanted to note that is because slowing it down more than two beats per minute changes the entirety of the song. It, it tends to make it sound bad. And when you think about it, if you slow it down a normal record or a normal song to by two beats a minute. So you let's say you, it's at 124 and you drop it to 122, it starts sounding bad. You're only adding about four to seven seconds, depending on how much you slow it down to that record. Now, four seconds, seven seconds is not a lot of time. An extra seven seconds is what you're saving to make it uncomfortable to dance, to make it uncomfortable to sing, to make it sound bad. And for seven seconds, having comfortable dancers moving on the floor with a little bit of energy is more important than giving them an extra seven seconds over a course of a night that's what, 28 seconds? You give we, them an extra we, 28 seconds to make them tired out. That's what you're doing. We, we try to record at 128 right now. There are some things because of the, that we actually recorded 130. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, 131, uh, just because it couldn't be slowed down anymore. Uh, back in the 80s, when we recorded, there was a lot of things recorded at 132, 134, one, you know, uh, and faster. Uh, but we try to not go below 128. There are a few because they were recorded. The original recordings might, might be on a 120 or one, and we sped them up actually to, to, but you couldn't go much. You can only go so far without really changing the feel of the song. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Rob. It's, um, just on a um, point that uh, Rod made, which was really good, is about how um, in music spanning the age gap, he spoke about big band. And one of the biggest changes with music is a lot of songs done by people like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin are actually still listened by young people because of somebody called Michael Bublé. Along come Michael Bublé, who started using all of the... Um, uh, there's probably... I reckon it, all of Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin's, all of their big songs have been covered by people like Michael Bublé. And one way to follow what music is trendy is to watch shows like The Voice or um, The X, X Factor, American Idol, depending which country you're in. Typically, songs being done on those sort of programs are things young people listen to. And have a look like on The Voice. I don't know if you guys have The Voice in the um, USA, but it's one of our main music talent shows here. If you look at The Voice... One of the main genres of songs being done are still the big band style stuff um, that goes back to the Frank Sinatra days because Michael Bublé's come along and made it trendy in the 21st century. And so if you're not sure what music young people listen to today, other than asking people, watching shows like The Voice and X Factor is a really good way to do it because songs which are being done on there are usually going to be songs which will appeal to younger people because younger people watch it mostly and the younger people vote on who wins. So they will look for songs that young people will vote for. Um, just quickly, another thing that Rod mentioned was about um, dancers leaving on a high, if you um, put the music at a good pace. And the other thing with that is um, momentum. We, If you leave the dance having just had a really good, upbeat night where you've danced with good energy, you leave on a high, it makes you want to go back next week. It helps keep people coming. If you come, if you leave a dance, and I, um, one of the caller who, uh, my mentor, Frank Kennedy, and um, Howard Coburn's on there, Howard was also trained by him. Um, and Frank Kennedy was a person who I danced at his club for six years until he retired from calling. And he couldn't rally with choreography, but it was always a great atmosphere. He always had good um, music. It was always a great atmosphere. And you left every club night wanting to go back in a fortnight in two weeks. And so for us, it was an hour and a half drive to get to Frank's club right through the city to get to Frank's dance. But we never thought, ah, we don't feel like going tonight because you're always left feeling happy. And you remembered how you left feeling happy two weeks later when you decided you're going to go. If you're doing really slow, um, if you've slowed down a lot using a lot more laid back music, then dancers don't leave feeling that high then they're more likely to not come back next week. When they're sitting there deciding, do I want to go out tonight? They're more likely to say, uh, the open fire and bottle of red wine feels more appealing than going to the club. So, yeah, dancers leaving on a high, feeling happy, 
that's what creates momentum, keeps them coming back week after week. So if if I don't do a upbeat song for the last song, my wife, well, she lets me know about it. <laughs> yeah, she changes the up from the beat. Helen, you had a comment. Uh, well, um, I I will be changing the subject um, uh, if that's okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, I thought it was uh, very interesting about the the music. Um, I teach quite a few older people, and I haven't really. I've learned a lot this evening about or, uh, what, how I should think in the future. So thanks very much. But what I was going to talk about a little bit is uh, how how fast you teach the different classes. Now here in Sweden. Mm -hmm we seem to be much, much, much slower than in US or in Australia because we teach basic in one year. That's the standard. Mm -hmm. We even have a senior club that teaches basic in two years. Mm -hmm. And my, um, one of my, or two of my clubs, they're older people. And um, I teach something one week and the next week we have to start again. And the next week we have to start again. And I can see no way I could teach them basic in less than a year. Um, now, unfortunately, they weren't graduated. And I, I'm a new caller, so these are some of my first classes. I still haven't graduated anyone, but that's uh, just uh, the way it is. But um, we really, really struggled to, to sort of finish in one year. How do you do it if you get people to plus in a year? How is it possible? It's a, it's a really good question. Um, one thing which um, depends on it, one thing I've noticed when calling through um, Europe is um, most of the clubs who take quite a while to teach their beginners, they have a very high standard of dancing. It's one thing where, and um, I know Rod down there said this a lot on Facebook, is in the USA, um, they, they may be teaching them quickly, there might be any dancers on the floor, but it sure doesn't correspond with good levels of dancing. But this is where um, the Club 50 system that um, Jerry Story has written. Um, also, I should give a shout out to Jerry and um, hope Jerry and Christy are getting better. For those who haven't heard, they've both got coronavirus, so fingers crossed for both of them. They come out of this fine. But anyway, what Jerry's written with Club 50 is a great system of... Um, getting regular intakes of new dancers without really rushing people up to mainstream um, too quickly. So that's why I think the sort of system that Jerry's written is well worth considering when we get out of um, coronavirus period of not dancing. Um, but as far as your question goes about how do we teach them like in a year, it's a good question. Um, from my perspective, um, if I'm teaching dancers to mainstream, it'll take me close enough to a year. You can teach dancers for calls, but for, to actually do different positions and make them competent, normally you're looking at um, close to a year to get them up to a good standard of mainstream. Um, okay. So, Okay, because in Sweden, we, we take uh, most clubs uh, work that you have one year in basic, then they like to keep another year for mainstream, which is only on what, 16 more calls, but still that's another year. And mm. then they don't really like people to go on to plus until the next year. So which means it's three years before you can dance yeah. a plus, uh, go to a plus dance, which is a problem of course, because uh, there are quite few uh, basic dances nowadays because the older people, they have higher levels and there's much more challenge mm. going around than there is basic. So that's a problem because people don't get to dance. Um, so, uh, Ellen, how long are your sessions? Uh, yeah, that's, that's another thing I was going to ask. Well, typically we have dance nights are between seven and ten, but then usually there's basic before we have a break. So maybe what maybe you get one and a half hours dancing basic uh, if you're a basic dancer. Then you usually have your coffee and then you go home, mm -hmm. uh, and after that there'll be another course and and. Um, so if you're, if you're learning plus, you're expected to be there to be an angel for the basics. So you get the three hours, but the beginners only get maybe one and a half hours once a week, but it's always once a week. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, do you have longer sessions or do you, or do you, are you, I mean, I, my, my older people at the clubs I have, this is just purely something to do during the day and I can't tell them, you know, you have to learn the definitions. I'm going to give you sort of, 
uh, a test or next week. I, I do it playfully, but but uh, they just they just don't learn it and they do they don't remember it, and um, we just have to sort of go over it again. Um, that's just one of the points I want to make. I, I just wanted to understand that you really managed to teach them in this time. It seems to me absolutely incredible. Another thing is, what do you do with, you always have in a group one or two dancers. After the first evening even, or the first day, you realize they're going to become square dancers. Out of yeah. these eight or 10 or 15 people, those two, three are going to become square dancers. How do you cater to them? Especially in the classes I have now, I have one group with very elderly people, but there are two women, uh, they're, they're young, they're not 60 yet. Uh, and I really want to make sure that they don't quit. Um, mm. You talked about sort of bringing into your home and teaching them on the side. I was thinking maybe I should just uh, each week teach a new call, I know that the others are not going to make it, but these two or three, they're going to have that call with them uh, yeah. so that I can tell them at the end of the term of the year that, okay, we've done all the basic now. Uh, you can go out and practice, whereas the others, they can't. I, yeah. I, I don't know. How, how do you do it? How do you people do it? Um, it's a really good question. Um, one thing I'd say, like, um, in regards to that with beginner classes, Usually, yeah, in the first few weeks, you'll see the people who are likely to become really good dancers and you'll see the handful that probably aren't. Um, we, over the past, I'm going to say four to five years, um, we, have, we haven't specifically told people not to come, but if we've got people in the class who are just not getting it, um, rather than tell them not to come, we've actually said to them that, um, maybe you would be better off finding another activity. Because as I've said before, is everybody has things they're good at and not good at. You know, um, and this is the thing, is I, um, I'm, I dance squares, I dance rounds. But yet um, when I went along and tried to do line dancing, I was terrible at it. You know, everybody has skills. And so with beginner classes, um, I think we've had a tendency nowadays in an attempt to hold on to as many people as possible that we will no longer tell anybody that they may, may not going to cope. We just try and keep them all. But ultimately, and again, I can only use my own experience as an example. On one of our evenings, we had a beginner, one guy who was <sighs> terrible, um, just was not getting it. But we had a class of six women and one man. So everybody was like, oh, you know, we'll keep him. You know, we need the men. Mm -hmm. problem was in our attempts to keep one person we lost five of the other beginners who got frustrated by the lack of progress so again sometimes it's like what i said with the example i gave of the four square club that lost two squares is sometimes in your attempt to hang on to one person you'll lose four so this is um as far as what to do with people who are like you said um learn it quickly but as again my own experience is we often will get them into our house, teach them the moves and get them up to dancing a little bit quicker. Um, and some will say, well, that's not ideal, but ultimately you need to do what you can to keep them. And if these people are going to stop coming because they're getting bored with a lack of progress, um, then you need to do whatever you can to keep them interested. Um, that's about all I could probably contribute on that. Yeah. Um, uh, Mark, you had a question. I just wanted to ask Helen, uh, is that a, uh, is that a class that you're teaching them at or is that, cause you said it's a dance night that they get to, that your basic gets to dance like an hour and a half. Is that okay on Saturday night we're having a dance and they get to dance what they know for an hour and a half or is that a class? Uh, well, that's, that's a class. I think that, um, um, I think that you in the States and in Australia organize things a little bit differently than we do in Europe or certainly in Sweden because in Sweden we have we have the clubs and each club has a, a, a night some bigger clubs have two nights but uh, we have one night and then you had, so this is a class before the coffee break you 
you're taught your your sort of your basic or your mainstream or a plus. And then of course the different clubs they uh, organize dances and therefore all the clubs. So you go to different clubs to do your dancing and then you have to be able to dance basic or sometimes when in the in the autumn we have a basic 24 after a few months so that the very new, new ones can dance the first 24 and then maybe towards the spring we have a basic 34 or 42 or something so that you know people can come out and dance before they learn the whole basic program but this is the club night and the club night is about teaching uh, in clubs that uh, have already they have plus dancers or a1 dancers then maybe after the break it'll be a a1 dance practice for example and then it's actually just dancing there'll be some workshopping of something or so on but but uh, so we have uh, if you have two callers then you'll have four courses during an evening if you have one caller mm -hmm. there'll be two courses during the evening uh, mm -hmm. that's the way it works yeah okay. um sort of on that what i've experienced the differences between europe compared to um, Australia and also where I've been in America is, and I think um, Barry's another one who um, backed this up, is the fact that in Europe, from what I've experienced, club nights are more um, considered as practice sessions, if you like, for the bigger dancers. And this was the thing I found was um, I called dance in Denmark and I went to their club night on the Thursday and most of the night was actually reviewing, most of their dancers have been to this special weekend the weekend before and a large amount of the club night was actually dancers saying oh um this call did something we didn't get that and all this sort of thing and it was revising and what was interesting was the callers actually said to me what are you going to do this weekend and i was like what they said well um can you write out all of the uh, um theming things you're going to do this weekend so we can warm our dancers up before and you know this this what i found um to explain to the americans is I think in Europe, the club nights are treated more as practice nights there for the big events. Whereas in Australia and America, our clubs um, are more just considered dance nights more so than practice nights. Um, the question you asked, which I didn't actually answer, was about um, the length, how long your nights go for, whatever. I think the hour and a half is pretty standard, an hour to an hour and a half worldwide. Um, I think a lot of callers in um, Victoria... Um, it used to do an hour. It was very common. You'd have beginners from seven till eight and mainstream from eight till 10. But um, the one thing we had some success with was for the last few years, we have had quite a few classes within an area. The Mornington Peninsula to get from the top of to the peninsula to the bottom would take you about 40, 45 minutes. And we had within this area, four or five different classes going in different towns, 10, 15 minutes apart. So what would happen is some people would go to multiple classes. So there were people that were coming to three or four different classes a week if they were really keen. And so they were able to learn cricket because they were getting um, it several times a week. So sometimes um, I don't think much more than an hour and a half beginner session is effective because people start getting brain dead. Yeah. But um, potentially if you've got the interest in the dancers, having two sessions a week for the beginners, it's worth looking at if you've got the interest from the people to do that. Yeah, yeah. We've talked also about having these um, crash courses or the shorter courses because we also realize that that young people today, you can't tell them, start this activity and next spring in, a, in two terms, you'll be able to go out and dance. That's not the way it works. You yeah. start an activity and you're sort of active and you're going out right away. So we have discussed different ways of, of making the process uh, much quicker. Uh, mm. But as I say, a standard in Sweden, basic takes one year to learn. Um, that's just the truth over here. Yeah. And uh, so we're, but we're looking at, at different ways to attract uh, the little uh, uh, people just a little bit younger uh, so that they can get started uh, quicker. Uh, so yeah. th that's, that's a point we have here, yeah. Yeah. Uh, good, 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 good morning, all. Um, one, I'd like to make one comment, if I could. Um, in terms of considering other ways of handling the situation, uh, if you've got experienced dancers who are prepared to come or if you can convince the people who are having trouble to come earlier, maybe you can work just a two-couple set up where you exercise those calls for them before the class starts. So you could do that for people who are struggling, but you can also turn that around and use it for the people who are running it, running ahead of the class 
mm. by, by giving them those extra calls earlier on. So using two couple techniques and if you've got an experienced dancer or even a trainee caller who could take that half hour before or that half hour after, mm. you, you could maybe cater for those situations in that way. Mm. It's um, we tried that system with some success with our beginners where basically we had graduated, but there was still some that were struggling. So during the half hour of round dancing before our club night, some of the experienced dancers, yeah, would go outside with them, form two couple groups or whatever and do that. But I think the key word in all of that, whether it's talking with teach weekends, getting people around to your house, um, ta getting them there half an hour earlier, the key which links all of that is one word, which is flexibility being flexible, that's the biggest thing, is trying to bridge gap between younger people, older people, people who struggle, people who get it quickly, everything. I think the key word is flexibility. We have to be flexible and be willing to change things to suit what we have. We have to be really flexible. I think that's a key word. Uh, Mark, Mark Hart, you had a question? Uh, yeah, well, it was, yeah, I guess it was kind of a question. Um, I've only been calling for about four or five, maybe six years now. Time goes by so fast. Um, but one thing I've noticed, and all I basically ever really get to do other than teach my handy capables class is guest tips. But the one thing I have noticed here in Southern California is a lot of, I don't know how you call it, uh, catering to that slow couple or that slow person mm. where you, everybody else is being held up because the caller's calling to that square to make sure that square makes through it. Mm. And that's where I think a lot of people are misunderstanding. They think a lot of callers are misunderstanding and dancers are misunderstanding saying that we're losing too much by catering to the old people. It's not the old people. It's those few old people that mm. are making it hard for everybody else. And the caller is catering to that couple. Yeah. So the whole rest of the floor is stopping and going, stopping and going. Mm. And I've been told by callers, I should slow it down. That way, everybody can make it through it. And I've already turned it down to 122. That's where I think some, that's, I was just wanted to say that, but it's not all old people. It's, you yep. see a lot of catering to that one or two people, and the whole floor <laughs> suffers because of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, when I, um, uh, and as Roz said earlier, is um, it's not a generalisation necessarily on older people per se. Um, in the course of when we're talking about pace and that, when the word older comes up, it's referring mainly to people who are older who are struggling to keep up. A lot of older people are young at heart. And if you're young at heart, when you're square dancing, you're young. You know, as, if you're young at heart, it doesn't matter what age you are. But... Um, the thing is, though, like, um, the key word there was everybody, and this is a problem, is people slow down on the premise we can cater to everybody. And that uh, this is the thing which I really disagree with, is the fact that we're not catering to everybody when we slow down. We are catering to a group of older people that aren't keeping up, and at the same time, we're probably going to lose any younger people we have, or even any older people that like it fast, that like it upbeat. So that's, I think, our biggest problem is in the thought of catering to everyone, we're actually doing the exact reverse. Bob Furr, you had a hand raised. Yeah, real quickly, um, in Omaha, we've successfully, uh, the club I dance with has been doing uh, their lessons differently, but it requires an immense amount of work on the part of the caller in being more organized and uh, and st staying energized. Uh, they do four hours every Sunday for six weeks. Um, 
of lessons and get through the mainstream program pretty successfully. In the last 10 years, we've had, uh, and part of the reason for doing this is that we take six weeks on, four weeks off, six weeks on, four weeks off, and we get multiple sets of lessons in the course of a year. And the, the club has tripled in size uh, because of doing multiple sets of lessons. Um, and yes, nobody is really ready to dance uh, at a festival the, when they come out of lessons. They, they need to go to some club dances, usually for about a month, and, and uh, uh, get up to speed, really. Um, but the hardest person up there for getting it done is the caller. The caller gets exhausted. I've only substituted for him once, and I was only asked to teach a couple of movements. And uh, um, so I, I'm not speaking from personal experience, but I watched the caller literally, he's more brain dead than the dancers are. We have to remember that it's not so long ago uh, in the 60s and 70s when the average dance was three hours, at least in this area. Um, and so four hours for less than the video, tell people differently they get through it they, and, and don't underestimate older people any of them the key to them learning to dance is more about unlearning uh, a bad habit that we develop as adults of thinking about how we're going to respond to, to a conversation and so they have to stop thinking about responding and start and focus like younger people do on um listening and doing um, and as soon as they learn to to listen to the caller uh, it, it 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 all speeds up it all gets easier um, and like I said we've only had one person who who really couldn't manage it and she was only about five years older than me she was about 70 and we just referred her to a club that had standard lessons of uh, where they take about 40 weeks to get through them. And uh, she did fine there. Well, that's um, sort of along that line is um, the, a system which can work is if you are getting um, older people who can't keep up anymore to be squ square dancing was being offered is there was often seniors clubs. Um, and in our, in my area, um, there, I guess they used to be more so than they are now, is they used to be seniors clubs. People who were getting too old to cope at a regular club would go to the seniors club, which was slower and easier for them. The problem we've got is a lot of people going to those clubs still then go to conventions and special events and so on. And this is part of the issue is um, I think it's a good, I think a system where you have a range of different clubs catering to the different groups of people was great. But if um, there's no use having somebody going to a seniors club where it's put down to, you know, 122 beats per minute or whatever so they can cope, um, and then them still going to special events and conventions where it's going to be faster and then not being able to cope. That's, sort of, I guess, part of the problem. Two, two points that you made there, Bob. One, you said a little while ago in the 60s and 70s. I just want to clarify, you, you, you are aware that that was 50 years ago, right? <laughs> Okay, a little while ago for me, and I have um, danced for an extremely long period of time. Yeah, the, the second one that you, you mentioned was something that's been pointed out a number of times in a number of different comments. Um, when my dancers, I'm just going to read this, when my dancers graduate, I tell them they're ready to go and dance anywhere in the world at that level. Um, you made a comment that where you are, when your dancers are told that, you know, they finished the program, you encourage them to go out and dance at other clubs. And they've got several months of dancing under the belt before they're ready to go to a convention. I know here in Australia, usually when dancers graduate, they're, they're pretty au fait or, you know, pretty solid with the levels, but they take their time that they say you're dancing mainstream. I know in Europe, um, Helen in Sweden, I know the Swedish classes, they do a year at basic, then they dance, but they have places for the basic dancers to go and dance a basic dance in a basic hall. Europe is very, um, very forthcoming with that. 
they have a basic hall. Basic is still a danceable level that they dance. And if your caller says you can dance basic, you can go into any basic hall anywhere and you'll be able to dance that level. That's why they take so long. It's something that used to be very prevalent in Canada, very prevalent through the States, but it's changed, in my opinion, not for the, the better. Um, one of the things that Jaden mentioned was the, he said he called it Club 50, but it's now called Social Square Dancing, which is the program that uh, Jerry has come up with. This is not a replacement for the basics. This is not a replacement for the mainstream. What it is is a standalone type square dance as a social activity to get a bunch of people together in a room. In 12 weeks, they can dance, you can get a new group, and they can all dance and have fun and socialize. It's all about the social activity of square dancing, not about the choreography, not about the level. Dancers that want to proceed past that can then go and learn the other 14 movements and the extended applications and so on and so on and so forth. But that social square dancing as a standalone program is just that. And as Jaden said, coming out of COVID, uh, it's when you think about it, it's going to be probably a year and a half, maybe two years before we get back to danceability, any semblance of it. There's going to be a big market for something to fill that gap, and that might be it. I don't know. I'm not a prophet, but it is something to consider. So have a look at it. Uh, Rod, you, you, sorry, you had your hand up there a moment ago, or has that been addressed? You're on mute. Yeah, I, 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 Jaden wanted to comment on that, I think. Um, yeah, just quickly, uh, an interesting point on sort of this line is one of the words which, and I mean, I used it myself earlier, but I think we use wrongly in square dancing is the word graduation. We say we've graduated dancers to the mainstream program. And the problem with the word graduation is, as we all know, we are never done learning. You know, there's always a different position, a different way to do things. We can always, dancers are never done learning because really, um, this is my argument with um, people who say um, you can't teach a program in a weekend. They say, well, the dancers aren't competent. Well, to get competent at anything, you have to do it. The biggest thing which makes dancers a good dancer is not only learning, it's also then getting on the floor and dancing, getting that experience up. And for me, the word graduation causes us problems because um, we give people the intention, ah, we've learned everything which is, couldn't be further from the truth. From my own perspective, um, I did a website development course a few years ago. When I graduated, did I keep going back and trying to learn more about website development? Not really. Once I graduated, it's just that mindset we get. So I think um, there's an argument to be made that the word graduation is part of the issue there as well. Yeah, it's the same argument that's been med, made as mm. levels. They want to take that word level, you know, mainstream level, basic level, because it gives the indication of advancement, capability, and quality, uh, as opposed to I have learned a program. I, I can dance the basic program. I can dance the plus program. I can dance the mainstream program. Uh, whether or not it's terminology, I don't know. Mm. Nobody really has an answer. Yeah. That, that, that's that been a cyclical argument for the last 40 years. Yeah, We have names and labels on the various programs because we need names and labels to identify, but it's not a quality control. It's a administrative standard that says, this is basic one, this is basic two, this is mainstream, whatever, so that a dancer can say, right, huh, that's a basic hall. Yes, I can dance basic. I know the basic program. I can dance in that hall. That's what the programs were for. Somehow they became a quality control and then they became a badge of honor to get to as fast as you can. And I have no idea why that was. I agree, I agree with Jaden on the graduation. In fact, I saw a lot of that going on with the, with the younger people saying, okay, this season I'm going to take up surfing. Next season I'm going to take up art. This, so when you graduate, okay, I'm done. Let's move on to the next project. Mm. Uh, I agree. You know, let's invite them to be members of the club at a certain point. I mean, be it the first night or the 10th night or the 50th night at some point. Hey, here's a badge. You guys, uh, we would like you to be part of our group. Uh, by the way, when you go to a dance, you can dance basic or you can dance mainstream. 
or you can dance plus, you know, uh, that I think you're, uh, like Mel said, that's uh, something that's got to be directed, uh, uh, looked at at some point is how we're going to, you know, unwind all these different levels and stuff mm -hmm. to make it uh, to work well. I wanted to address what Helen was talking uh, before we in COVID. I taught at a, I, I had a class at a seniors center for the seniors there, and we only worked an hour a day. Uh, and, and you're right, they had no attention retention. They, uh, you teach a call this week, and you pretty much have to teach it. So it, it takes forever. But on our in Southern California, we go from zero to plus from September to June, basically into May. And uh, and and like was mentioned, the the quality is not there. But we uh, we we teach three to two to two to four calls a night. The first night we teach say fifteen calls, gets people on the floor dance, uh, and and. You just kind of like, okay, hey, first tip, we dance a little bit. Second tip, we, re we re review what we taught last week. The next two tips, we uh, we teach new calls, and then we dance what we did. Uh, you know, typically, the minimum is an hour and a half to two hours. Uh, some classes are even two and a half. Uh, I like what Bob was saying about the four-hour class. You could actually teach a lot in that time frame if the people don't. But... Uh, at the very beginning, the people are not ready to learn that much. To, and, and you teach one too many calls, and they're not, they're going to be like Jaden said, well, this wasn't fun because you, 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 the brain dead at that point. So it's a really balancing act. Uh, you, and it's something that as a caller, we learn that uh, sometimes because we did it wrong. <laughs> we learn. Well, how come nobody's here this week? What did we do last week was wrong. Uh, so mm. the the two hours seems to work here, but uh, we do um, kind of shy away from some of the, some of the calls. We don't stress them as much as others. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is is when we I have calls that are that need a little more work. The two couple squares are excellent because the people learn to calls without rely upon relying upon someone else to, to push them through it's just you and no other couple you have to learn the calls you can't do that with say a relay the deuce or a spin chain of gears or something but for a lot of the calls that, that two couple of squares gives them the confidence that they learn to call themselves i'm done just um, on the idea of how we label our programs, and this actually goes back to the actual youth topic, which today was on, is I saw something, um, a flyer for a dance, it's, I think it's about 30 or 40 years ago. It goes back quite a long time. And rather than say the dance was mainstream or the dance was plus, anyway, the dance setup was the afternoon was at the plus program and the evening was at mainstream or whatever the programs were called in those days. But rather than just call from that, the actual thing said, um, up the afternoon session will be utilizing um, calls up to the plus program and the main and the evening will be utilizing calls up to the mainstream program. The idea of rather than specifically put a label on, say that we are teaching calls. And so I, we teach our dancers mainstream, then we can say to them, well, you can go anywhere where there's mainstream rather than use mainstream as a real label on what you can do, just say, well, this dance, this will be a square dance and we'll be utilising the mainstream list. It's a slight change. And where it comes back to younger people is um, a number of dance programs um, in this area where there are young people involved use labels like that. Um, one of the line dance groups in our area um, where there's quite a few young people involved there the terminology they use is they will say um, this this will be a line dance. We'll be utilising dancers at the easy level, at the intermediate level, etc. So it's a very slight change of wording. But rather than saying um, you are a plus dancer, you are a mainstream dancer, you are an advanced dancer, 
when we're saying you are a square dancer that just happens to know the mainstream list or the plus list and so on. So it's a slight change, but it means we're not labeling dancers as your plus dancer and so on. And I think something like that is worth considering. Everybody's a square dancer. If you can dance up to C3A or you can only dance mainstream, you're still a square dancer. There's no difference. One of the comments that came up about that is um, with the advent of Facebook and social media and advertising dances globally around the world, uh, we might get, you know, the, the whoop whoop promenaders are having a dance this or a weekend dance. And that's what it says. And people assume that everybody knows what level that club dances at. So there are a lot of flyers and a lot of advertisements that say open dance and you arrive at the dance and it's a plus dance or it's an advanced and plus weekend or, or things like that. So it, the, the program label is important, mm. but disassociating it to a quality and a capability is what is really necessary. Um, well, if it says a basic dance, that means you can expect to dance the basic level program. If it says mm -hmm. mainstream, you can expect, and as you're saying, up to the full mainstream program. That's important. Well, call, labeling calls it one a, through fifteen, or calls one through twenty-five, or yeah, however, however you do it, yeah. you know. Yeah. And that's what you say, calls one through twenty-five. I know in Europe and in Canada, that was a big, a big thing on the list, but that was more for callers than dancers. Um, callers used to get together and say, right, we're having a basic dance. Where are your dancers at? Well, my dancers are at movement number 30, mine are at number 25, mine are at number 12, but we've also done this. And then you set the level for the dance for all the callers to call at. Those are the movements that are available. You don't go beyond that. Because not all callers follow the same teaching list. So 1 to 25 does not always have the meaning. But that's more of an, again, an administrative action that callers tend to forget that we are calling for dancers. We've got to be able to make sure our dancers can dance what we're advertising without making them feel diminished because they don't dance a higher program. You had a comment on it, Jaden? Um, well, on that point, we have this problem, and I think it's worldwide, bear in mind, but we've had this issue in Victoria a little bit where dancers have been advertised as mainstream and plus. And for some people, that means 50-50, it means one plus bracket, two plus brackets, etc. I have tended to label it now as the exact, if I'm doing mainstream with two plus brackets through the night or two plus tips, depending where you are, I will put on the flyer mainstream with two plus tips. Um, but anyway, again, back to that point is the problem I see is that we need the label so people know what they can dance. But the problem is the labels are being used not as saying what people can dance, they're being used to label individual dancers. We're looking at people saying they're plus dancers, they're A dancers. And there was a natural class system there where advanced dancers feel like um, they know more than the mainstream dancers. So this is my thing, is a very slight change of wording where instead of saying you're a mainstream dancer, it's you're a square dancer and you happen to know the mainstream list. You're a plus, you're a square dancer, you have to know the plus list and so on. So we can advertise dancers, for example, like if you have an evening where you're going to have eight mainstream brackets and two plus brackets, you can actually advertise as um, majority of the evening will be um, brackets at the mainstream program and there'll be a couple of brackets for people who know the plus calls. This is, for me, the only thing the levels are is saying how many calls somebody has learnt. So if we can get away from labelling dancers and just use the labels as a way to tell people what they can and can't dance, I think it's a plus. I'm, I'm just going to let everybody know we're digressing from the actual topic. Yeah. Uh, I mm -hmm. want to say a very, very big thank you to Jaden. I'm going to stop recording. The, the session's still open for discussion, um, yeah. but we're now going into hour number three. So, uh, Jaden, you said you were a bit worried that everybody was going to, well, you know, it's not really the most exciting topic. Um, you've kept more people here on discussion on a myriad of topics, so very, very well done. Thank you. Thank uh, you, Jaden. I'll have Jaden and you. back. And Thank I'm going to stop recording, but the room is still open. So, please, carry on with the discussion.